Welcome everyone to attend the Twin Jewels uh, virtual seminar. This event is co-organized by Tom's and me, or co-organized by IC China Division. Uh, but Tom's uh, Siegel from uh, Australia and, uh, and me from Beijing Normal University, we are um, uh, co-organizing the, the six uh, seminars. This is the fourth seminar. We're in fact very uh, glad to have uh, Sarah Ho uh, today. She's a professor of economic geography from University of uh, Nottingham. Uh, she has many titles. Uh, due to time limit, I just <laughs> omit this, uh, this part uh, to save more time for people to ask questions. So, um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased to be here and I'm, I'm presenting some ongoing and new research for one of the first times in an academic um, context. So I'm really, really um, pleased to be able to do that, but also would love feedback because it's a, quite an early stage, as you'll probably see. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that the um, research that I'm talking about today um, is being conducted alongside Dr. Martin Hennigan, who's working as a research fellow with me um, on the um, project at the University of Nottingham. Um, so the project is part of a wider interdisciplinary um, initiative within the UK, looking at the um, impact of Brexit on the UK's politics and economics. So it's quite interesting in that um, it's not just, it's by no means just economic geographers. Um, in fact, it's by no means just economists. There's a lot of political scientists also working um, on the project. Um, but the strand that I, I'm working on um, is really looking at the impact and potentially opportunities for the UK services sector um, in terms of Brexit, the UK's departure from the um, EU, which essentially took effect from the 1st of January this year, 2021. Um, I think working on services in this um, sense and financial services in particular is really interesting and um, the Irish Chambers of Commerce described um, services as the forgotten child of Brexit and argued that a lot of attention was on the manufacturing base of the UK economy um, and for those of you in the UK and to an extent in um, Europe I'm sure you will have read about the potential for um, traffic jams of lorries in the run-up to the UK's departure from the EU and there's a sense I think in some quarters that services have been comparatively neglected in relation to Brexit and that this is potentially quite um, problematic from an economic geography point of view because the UK is predominantly a services economy. They make about 80% of the UK, UK's um, output. But crucially, ser tradable services and particularly financial services are an area of considerable strength for the UK. Um, and the UK has run a trade surplus in financial services and services more generally. And crucially, um, a lot of that is to do with exports to the EU when we're talking about um, Brexit. Um, so, yeah, this is why I think um, this focus is interesting. So um, it's not just that the UK is a services economy vis-a-vis -vis Brexit. It's the fact that a lot of the strength of services in the UK came from financial and other business services, particularly here legal services would be um, a good example. So we're really starting to paint a picture here of the fact that we haven't paid that much attention to services vis-a-vis -vis Brexit. And that's particularly important because of the importance of exports to the UK services sector, and especially when we're looking at financial and related business services. The picture becomes even more important, I would argue, when we look at where those exports go to, because collectively the EU has been the largest export market for um, financial services and indeed um, services. The largest country um, is the, the USA, but as a block, um, it's the um, EU. And um, I'm the only geographer really working on this um, wider interdisciplinary project, so I quite like reminding people when they see charts like this, that geography really does matter, and um, particularly when it comes um, to trade, et cetera. Um, why, I, why I think the project is interesting from a more intellectual point of view is that in many ways, Brexit is an economic geography and you can't understand 
the decision to leave the UK in terms of the political vote um, and its implications without thinking and taking seriously the geography of the UK. So there's been quite a lot written about the um, uneven geographical distribution of the vote to leave um, the UK and whether and to what extent this was a reflection of particular um, regions voicing disquiet with the UK's um, economic growth model that it had pursued particularly following the 2007-8 crisis. But when we think about the financial services that I'm working on in, as part of this project, I think it really speaks to some of the key um, elements of what we might term a, a geographical imagination for economic geography. So fundamentally, it's around borders. Um, and as we'll see in, in the case of financial services, it's about the construction of a new border um, or a, a renewal of a border between um, the UK and the EU when it comes to financial services trade. It's also about territories, about how regulatory space is being remade um, within the UK and also um, within the EU. And it's also about how firms and other economic actors are navigating these fundamental changes in the economic geography of the UK and its relationship to the EU. I, I want to just send, um, spend a little bit of time saying a little bit more about the project as a whole, because this is a point I want to return to at the end of the presentation. So, um, as I said, it's a three year project. We're just coming to the end of year two. And um, the part that I'm working on is looking at um, financial services and their response to um, Brexit. I should say that um, the research as a whole looks at financial centres across the UK. Um, and there's quite an important set of analysis going on about the implications for regional financial centres. Um, I'm flagging this because I'm not actually really going to talk about that regional dimension today, but I just wanted to note that I think that's an important element and I'd be happy to take questions on that um, later on. Um, the project um, involves a mixed methods approach to trying to track impacts and any potential opportunities for Brexit for UK financial services. So we're just in the midst now of undertaking semi-structured interviews with key stakeholders. So this has ranged from government ministers and the heads of trade bodies, key participants in the financial service sector itself, both in the UK and in Europe. Um, and that's the main um, data source that I'm drawing on in my analysis today. And um, it also um, involves looking at um, policy analysis, um, official corporate statistics, and also oral histories of some of the key actors um, around the time of the Brexit vote, which was um, five years ago this month, in fact. And um, the, the project also has quite a significant um, emphasis on public engagement. Um, so for those of us working in the UK, this is often framed as an impact agenda. Um, I think a lot of us would have quite a few um, concerns about the narrowness with which um, impact is configured. Um, but I, I raise this now because it's a point I return to at the end of the paper that quite a lot of the work that we've been doing on the project is about um, I would say rather than impact, sharing our information and knowledge and entering dialogue with a range of different audiences beyond the academy. So this has included school children. It also includes policymakers like the Shadow Cabinet, for example, and practitioners and the media. So it's, it's configured slightly differently from a, a, a normal research grant. So this is one of the reports from the project which looked at the um, economic impacts of, of a no-deal Brexit. Um, being shown on Sky News, which is a major cable news um, channel in the UK. But I want to return to this because I think um, there's something interesting to be written around how work that is set up in a kind of public engagement vein, which this um, grant was, and what that might mean for method in economic geography and where the div divide comes between methods and um, engagement. So what I want to do um, in the paper today is really focus on one of those key um, geographical imaginations around Brexit, um, which is the border, um, and to locate the changing nature of the UK-EU border within a, a wider set of literatures on regulation in financial and economic geography. Um, and the argument I want to make is that um, 
is really a sympathetic critique of work on economic geography and financial geography and regulation to date and suggests that regulation doesn't just make territorial space, but is a, a crucial infrastructure, if you like, in, in making and remaking borders. Um, so what I want to start by doing is placing work on regulation within financial geography and thinking about some of the questions this poses when we think about Brexit. Um, I'm then going to move more into the empirical part of the paper. Um, and I'm going to start by looking at what the Brexit trade deal, or to give it its full name, the UK-EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement, or TCA, means for financial services and how this has impacted financial regulation, particularly in the UK. Um, I'm then going to look at the UK's response to this in regulatory terms and particularly take on this question of or whether Brexit really has been about taking back control. This was one of the key leitmotifs that was um, used by supporters of Brexit that would allow the UK to take back regulatory control um, in financial services. Um, and here I'm going to suggest that whilst there was an appetite for taking back control politically, what this actually means in terms of financial services regulation has been much more debatable and is really only just becoming um, apparent in some early regulatory responses. And, and then I'm going to um, conclude by returning to this wider question of regulation and some of the other points that I made at the start around how a kind of public engaged economic geography might work methodologically. And in the conclusion, I, I take on um, my colleague Andrew Leishen's paper with Adam Tickell, where he wrote about the making and breaking of regulatory space vis-a-vis -vis, um, Bretton Woods and, and sort of take a play on that and think about how Brexit really is about the breaking and remaking of reg regulatory space in the post-Brexit city. I think I saw Andrew on the call, so um, no doubt we can have a um, discussion about that um, in a minute. Um, so obviously there's a really long history and an extensive literature within financial geography on um, regulation. And, and you know, we could think about the sort of neo-grumption approach, we could think about the regulation school, um, given that it's a hot sunny afternoon here in the UK and, and later on in the day for many of you, I'm not going to go through a very detailed treatment of regulation as it's figured in financial geography, but I'm just gonna tease out some of the key um, approaches and elements that I want to draw on in this argument. Um, and the, my starting point really is this paper by um, Andrew Leishen and Adam DeKell, um, where they are calling for a kind of renewed um, um, interest in regulation and, and thinking about the ways in which regulation isn't a thing, but is something that is made and can't always be easily predicted. And I think this is really important when we come to Brexit um, for a heavily regulated sector like financial services, um, what it does for what Brexit does for regulation is really, really important. What I'd suggest though, is that much of this work that has looked at regulation is um, has looked at the implications of regulation within um, particularly a nation state, so how um, regulation reshapes um, territorial spaces, and to a slightly lesser extent has looked at how regulation configures subnational spaces, and obviously critical here in terms of financial services would be the City of London um, in um, the case of, of Brexit. So in some of my earlier writing, I've thought about how um, territories might be remade through regulation and um, drawing particularly um, on the work of Brett Christopher's. I find this um, quote really quite um, thought provoking. But what I want to suggest um, in this paper is that there might be a really productive dialogue to be had between financial and economic geography on the one hand and political geography, um, which has um, developed I think quite an interesting and revitalized approach to borders um, in recent work. So I would like to think about how regulation and financial services regulation not just shapes territorial spaces, but by extension is also a really important border infrastructure. Um, there's been a lot of work, as I say, in, in political geography in this um, spirit, and this is the work that I'm drawing on here, which really thinks not just about borders, but also about the practice and performance of bordering, the process of making borders. 
Um, this literature is really helpful because it doesn't just assume that what happens or sorry, a border is made in the border region itself. Borders can be made through um, decisions and activities made elsewhere. And clearly, um, although much of the work on in political geography is talking about the kind of materiality of borders, when we're talking about the service sector, and um, borders are often made through regulatory processes that aren't made at the, the border itself, but are made in key sites of power, notably London in the case of financial services um, and Brexit. And also um, this work draws attention to the performative dimensions and the discursive um, elements of borders and bordering. Um, and in the paper, I talk a little bit more about this because I think this is quite an interesting connection between this work and the discursive approach to regulation that Leishen and Tekel were are developing in, in their paper. Um, I also think that this approach is quite helpful and important empirically. And in the context of Brexit, um, and rightly so, a lot of attention has been paid to the Irish border. And um, so this is a, a picture of a Twitter account which existed during the um, run up to the conclusion of the trade deal called the Irish border, which was a Twitter account about, um, as it suggests on the tin, um, the sort of uh, remaking and changing nature of the Irish border. So I'm, I'm suggesting that there's some interesting dialogue to be had here between um, I would say economic geography and um, political geography, particularly thinking about regulation as a kind of border infrastructure or a set of practices that helps processes of bordering. Um, in particular, in this um, case, what I'm interesting is interested in is how regulation moves across borders and indeed new borders, in this case between the EU and the UK. Um, what happens to regulation when it moves? Is there a process of translation? Does it move, move in an inert fashion? What sort of borders emerge? Is it a porous border? Does it work the same way from the UK to the EU as from the EU to the UK? Um, and how do and how are financial services firms and policymakers navigating this? and with what outcomes. So I, I think there's a whole set of really important questions um, around the seemingly very dry and often very technical question of um, financial services regulation post-Brexit. So I'm now um, going to um, dive into the um, empirical part of the paper. So um, the kind of renewed border between the UK and the EU for financial services comes about because of the implementation of the UK EU trade deal from the 1st of January um, this year. Um, like other free trade agreements, um, it doesn't do very much to ease service, cross border services trade. So um, you can see this, you know, very simply by the fact that the documents over 1,200 pages long at the term financial services appears six times. Fish, which became a kind of totemic issue in the Brexit negotiation, Brexit negotiations, appears 16 times. And um, I should say though that 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 is not necessarily unique to this trade deal. It poses particular issues for the UK because of its reliance on financial services, but it's not uncommon in um, free trade agreements. And um, I should also say that. Um, the context of this trade deal is unusual, I think almost unique, in that it's a trade deal about creating a border, not reducing borders. Um, and I think that that's quite a um, key element of the argument um, and the research that we're working on at the moment. So what this essentially, in very broad terms, means for financial services is that financial services firms operating in um, London lost on the 1st of January the right to passport into the UK, into the EU, sorry. So passporting allowed UK firms to use their UK base to service EU clients, put very simply, and without the need to seek additional authorization or regulatory clearance in those EU member states. And it's argument that these this passporting process has been really central to the development of London as Europe's financial centre, leading financial centre in lots of ways. Um, and 
um, it's based passporting has essentially been the mechanism through which UK financial services firms could access the single market. And there's been a lot of discussion about how UK financial services will access the single market outside of the EU. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about this process later on in the paper, but essentially the UK is now being treated the same, some would argue the same, some would argue not, um, as other third countries um, and is reliant on equivalence decisions. And equi an equivalence decision um, is basically a, a unilateral decision made by the EU um, in a specified set of areas, so it doesn't cover the whole of financial services. And in any one of those areas, the EU can grant the UK an equivalence decision if the EU deems UK regulation to be equivalent to um, the EU's. Um, there are a number of issues with this, and in the um, period between the referendum and the implementation of the trade deal, there was a lot of discussion um, in financial services itself and within government around how appropriate equivalence would be for the UK financial services sector. Um, essentially, equivalence is not the same as passporting. It's much more specific in terms of the areas that it relates to. Um, and they can also be withdrawn by the EU with 30 days notice. So it doesn't give the same degree of um, permanent market access that passporting do. The further example, the further issue, sorry, with this is um, shown just very briefly in the table on the right. So I don't expect you to, to read the table in detail at all. Um, but down the left hand side, you have the areas um, that the EU can grant equivalence in and across the top of the chart are different countries. Um, and really, the, the chart is just there to show you that the UK currently only has two equivalence decisions. They're both time limited um, with the EU. So it has less market access um, of using equivalence than places like the US and um, Singapore. So there's been a fundamental change in how um, the um, UK financial services can or cannot access um, the EU single market and essentially it adds potential cost and complexity to UK-based financial services firms. Um, this is quite striking really when you think about the strategic importance of financial services in the UK economy. And when kind of pushed on this, um, when the deal came out, Boris Johnson, the prime minister did say that, and I quote, perhaps the deal does not go as far as we would like for um, financial services. Sorry, I, I don't know if you heard that for some reason, my phone started talking to me. Um, in addition to the free trade agreement, um, the UK and the EU also agreed a memorandum of understanding. And um, the content of this was agreed in March 2021. But last time I checked, they hadn't formally signed this, which is interesting in itself. Um, around this time, there was in March now, this year, there was some um, commentary that perhaps this looked like a more positive outcome for um, financial services. Um, however, our reading of it and that um, coming out from our research is, is rather more sceptical. Um, and, and this quote here from a trade body CEO um, really kind of exemplifies the, the sense on the ground on this that it's not, not important to have an MOU and it may well help um, facilitate um, dialogue and, and may allow regulatory trust to be um, developed between the UK and the EU, but it's not a decision-making body. Um, crucially, it's not legally binding. So it, it, it goes a small way to helping ameliorate UK-EU financial relations, but I don't think you could say that it goes much further than that. Um, and again, this is quite similar to what the EU has in place with other countries. So these changes um, and rupture really in how UK financial services firms um, can access the EU single market has led to some displacement of financial services activity out of London. Um, latest estimates are suggesting around 7,400 jobs have left London and to go to a number of um, European financial centres. 
Um, and this has also been followed by the movement of assets. Um, the, they're not going to the same different parts of financial services are starting to concentrate in different European financial centres. Um, and we, we could say more about this, I don't particularly in this paper, but very generally, and um, Frankfurt appears to be attracting most of the banking assets, market infrastructure is being concentrated in Amsterdam, um, and asset management type activity in Dublin and Luxembourg. And um, the interesting exception to this is Paris, which seems to be attracting more of a kind of full service range of financial services activity. Although there seems to be evidence that a lot of the headquarter location isn't going to Paris. So it's attracting a wider range of kind of um, less senior financial services activity. Um, and in another paper, we talk about, about Paris in, in more detail because there seems to be something slightly different um, going on there. I think it's also important to note that there are um, these, this pattern is being replayed in cities across the UK. So it's not just a London phenomenon. And there are some arrivals to the UK. Um, so, for example, um, Goldman Sachs has um, announced a plan to increase essentially its fintech operations in Birmingham. So I wouldn't want to suggest that it's just a one way, um, a one way flow of, of change, although the, the emphasis is on outward from the UK. Um, so, um, we, you know, we, we will have seen quite a lot of press reporting that suggests that, um, you know, potentially London is being overtaken by um, places like Amsterdam in particular. Um, and really, I've, I've put this up here to um, stress that it's actually, I think, too early to tell what the final outcome will be in terms of what Brexit means for European um, financial services. Um, a lot of the interest in um, Amsterdam was a reflection of um, the relocation of EU listing of shares, which left London largely to go to Amsterdam. And um, this is what one interviewee described to us as a kind of a part of financial services where Brexit is binary. So there was something that could take place in London on the 31st of December, which couldn't take place legally or regulatorily when markets reopened on the 4th of January. There were public holidays from the 1st to the 3rd of January. And um, so um, this person's argument is that this, in many ways, this isn't a surprise. We knew that this activity was going to need to relocate. But as they say at the end, there are only a small number of sectors where the impact of Brexit is this binary and this negative. So um, how did we get to this um, position? Um, here, I think it's important to note that although the political rhetoric was that Brexit was going to mean Brexit, what Brexit meant for financial services was not specified at the start, um, and in many ways is still being worked out. Um, so what we've done in, in the research is kind of traced the short history of what Brexit's meant for financial services since the referendum vote five years ago. Um, and initially, I think there was a sense, not unanimously, but unis um, quite widely of shock within um, financial services um, about the outcome of the referendum. As this person said, I, I'd say that the vote came something of a, of a surprise to a lot of people. Um, every company had their contingency plans in place um, and they they started to prepare for it practically, but it still came um, as a shock. I think the key moment where what Brexit would mean for financial services started to become apparent was in May 2018, which was when the then Prime Minister Theresa May made what is now called her Chequers speech, where she was clear that Brexit would mean the end of free movement for the UK. And in response, the, the EU was clear that you can't cherry pick um, aspects of the single market. So if you were going to end free movement, there wouldn't be um, single market access. Um, and so the financial services sector then started to look at, at what that might mean for this sector in particular. So this is in the kind of first two to three years now after the vote. And there was a sense at this point that perhaps a sort of special deal could be cut out for financial services, reflecting the strength of the sector for the UK. And um, 
I think this actually reflects UK interests more than EU interests. And when we've interviewed people in the EU, they're quite clear that, um, you know, for a number of member states in the EU, financial services is probably not even in their top five most important um, things to discuss. And it's particularly important in the UK for the reasons I gave at the start of the presentation, but that isn't the case more generally. But at this point, as our research participants explained to us, there was a sense that surely everyone's going to want to minimize disruption here. Can we do some sort of special deal essentially for financial services, potentially around the mutual recognition of UK, EU um, financial services? Um, there was quite widespread political support for this um, by early 2018, including from the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Bank of England Governor. Um, but this wasn't shared by the EU, who viewed it as cherry picking the benefits of um, single market um, access. And this was dropped then as a negotiating approach by mid 2018. There was then a sort of further attempt at some kind of special deal for financial services and right up now, um, I'm talking about 2020, so the final 12 months of negotiating the trade deal, when the then um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sajid Javid, was arguing, you know, could, could something like permanent equivalence be um, carved out for UK financial services? So remember I said that equivalence um, came with a kind of 30-day notice period, so, so it, it sort of permanent equivalence is almost a tautology because in the EU's terms that, that can't exist, EU equivalence is time limited. There's some really interesting being, work being done by political scientists that looks at these kinds of issues to think about how financial services in the city in particular failed to um, kind of uh, lobby really for its preferred outcome and the difference between this kind of set of negotiations and previous um, discussions around the UK's relationship with the with Europe. So, for example, um, when tests were developed as to whether the UK would join the euro, financial services were singled out for special treatment. Um, and this is really quite different in the, in the Brexit negotiation. So um, the outcome of that was the kind of essentially no deal financial services um, Brexit, um, which then raises the question about um, what, what is the UK proposing to do with its newfound control of domestic financial services regulation? Um, you know, is, is this going, you know, what will taking back control look like? Um, and various discourses have circulated now for a couple of years about what this might look like. So one version was a kind of, would the city become a Singapore on Thames? this being used as a shorthand for a highly deregulated financial services centre. And um, I think the key point there is that I'm not sure that financial services practitioners in Singapore would see themselves in that light anyway. Um, and there's, in our research, certainly, there's not a strong appetite within the sector for really aggressive deregulation. Um, I think here the 2007 eight financial crisis casts quite a long shadow over what financial services in the UK um, feels it can or perhaps even should do in regulatory terms. Um, Rishi Sunak, the now um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, has suggested that there might be the possibility for a Big Bang 2.0, which again is, is alluding to a kind of significant period of deregulation. Um, Big Bang previously re uh, referring to the 1980s in London. I think what we're actually seeing on the ground is, is a little bit more nuanced than both of those outcomes. Um, and the example that I put on the screen here kind of summarizes um, our findings is that a lot of the sector now is looking at how they can mitigate the obvious negative impacts of Brexit. And they see Brexit more as an occasion to rethink regulatory frameworks rather than the cause of regulatory change. Um, that being said, I think um, behind the scenes, there's quite a lot of regulatory changes um, being reviewed, being proposed for the UK, which, which are quite deregulatory and pro-market um, in nature. And I'm just going to briefly um, run through these um, and what they mean in terms of the UK-EU border. Um, so there's three elements here. Um, so the first is 
what happened in regulatory terms to manage the UK's exit from the EU? Or to put it in the terms of this paper, what happened in regulatory terms to create a UK EU border in financial services? Um, and here, the UK's approach was quite different from the EU's. Um, so in this initial period, the UK essentially onshored EU financial services regulation to avoid a cliff edge, cliff edge Brexit. Um, and in particular, it created a temporary permissions regime so that firms using a passport to service um, UK clients from the EU could continue um, to do so. It's also taken a very different approach on equivalent. So you'll recall that I said the EU granted the UK equivalents in two areas. Um, the UK has granted the EU equivalents in 22 um, areas. Um, the UK has is also um, trying to manage the EU's approach to onshoring financial services activity, or at least respond to it. So in some areas, like the example I gave around um, EU shares, Brexit is binary, but there's quite a large gray area where what needs to be undertaken where isn't widely agreed upon between the UK and the EU currently. Um, and this has led the Bank of England governor, Andrew Bailey, to ask financial institutions essentially to almost check with the Bank of England before moving activity to the EU. And um, there's a sense within the Bank of England that the EU is asking for more onshoring than is strictly necessary um, in regulatory terms. So this was um, the process by which the initial border was um, created post-Brexit. The second uh, set of activities that's happening is that um, the border itself has changed since then um, because we are seeing changes to UK regulation. Um, in the media, this gets talked a lot about as regulatory divergence. I think that's um, quite problematic. It often assumes that the UK is going to diverge from a kind of fixed EU point. Um, whereas actually regulation is more dynamic than that and divergence could come about through changes on the EU on the EU's part as well. Um, this is the area that we're working on um, at the moment and um, I think is really important and a real area to watch in terms of what happens to UK financial services post Brexit. So at the moment, the UK has a future regulatory framework review and the phase two of which is due to report later this year. There's a really critical element here that this review needs to decide, which is how much of UK financial services regulation post Brexit will require parliamentary scrutiny and how much won't. Um, and this is important because um, I think very broadly put, less parliamentary scrutiny may lead to more pro-market regulation um, on the one hand. Um, on the other hand, as I said, I, I, there's a really strong sense coming through from the research that the sector lives under the long shadow of the 2007-8 financial crisis and so doesn't want, is at least cognizant of not wanting to appear to be hyper um, deregulatory. Um, the UK has also implemented the Financial Services Act this year, um, and this is very technical, but quite interesting if you're um, interested in what the future direction of UK financial services might be, um, because in this act, the Treasury, which is the kind of financial services part of the UK government, um, was given powers to um, onshore international regulation that hadn't been implemented at the time the UK left the EU. And um, so what the UK does in relation to that, and particularly Basel III, will be one of the key indicators of what the UK is planning to do in the future. Further clues are provided in that act by um, a set of what are called have regards for the Bank of England. So the Bank of England needs to under, undertake certain duties and is given, in addition to these statutory duties, some have regards. So it has to do something having regard for or being cognizant of. Um, these wider interests. And these again provide some early clues, I think, of where the UK may be heading in terms of financial services regulation. So a lot of the policy documentation coming through emphasizes London as an open but um, high standards financial services centre. And certainly when you speak to 
policymakers, they are the phrase that, that phrases that get used very, very frequently. And how that trade-off works, I think, is going to be one area to look at. Um, but there are some other um, interesting elements for these requirements for the Bank of England, particularly in terms of the intersection between finance and the so-called real economy, um, which I think reflects the Johnson government's interest in, in levelling up and regional development, and also vis-a-vis um, -vis future trade deals, which is an, a key area of um, economic policy uh, in the UK currently. And then the third area of regulatory activity that I think is important to look at is where we might see um, regulatory divergence and the, the making of regulatory borders in specific parts of financial services. So what Brexit means for financial services is slightly different in different parts of financial services. And really, since Brexit, there's been a plethora of reviews on different parts of the UK financial services sector. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but... Um, these relate to listings regimes, fintech, payments, um, how the UK regulates smaller banks. Um, is it going to adapt different regulatory standards for smaller banks, for example? So I think, again, these sort of, um, specific elements of um, regulation will be important in terms of signalling the direction the UK wants to take. So um, what this whistle stop tour has done, I hope, is, is three things. One is think about how um, financial services regulation might be an important element in making and remaking, and I guess potentially breaking borders. Um, and we've, we've been particularly interested in what happens when regulation moves, which is essentially what's happened um, with Brexit, the UK has onshored EU regulation and is now in the process of working out its own um, future regulatory um, approach post-Brexit. Um, I'd like to stress again the sort of centrality of a geographical imagination in understanding Brexit and financial services. I think it speaks to some of the key concerns of financial geography around space and place, around borders, and around how firms and um, navigate those. And um, earlier on in the Brexit process, this was really set up as a kind of almost a trade-off between, you know, to what extent would the UK privilege regulatory auton autonomy and taking back control in inverted commas over single market access. The Brexit that has been pursued is much more towards the former. They've privileged regulatory autonomy. Um, and so now I think it's important to look at what, what the UK is and is proposing to do with that newfound regulatory control. But thirdly, um, and in a more reflexive note, the researchers mainly think about what happens when you do research which has a strong um, emphasis and requirement from the funder on my part, um, around kind of pub engagement with different public audiences. Um, and I think there's something really interesting to be written here around when you engage with economic geography in the wild, to use Michelle Callan's term, you know, as policymakers are, are remaking borders, etc. that in some ways um, engagement merges with method in some quite interesting ways. So, for example, if you're um, giving evidence to a parliamentary select committee and they ask you certain questions, that then does inform the kind of questions that um, start to shape your, um, your own thinking um, on the topic, just to give um, one very simple example. Um, so yeah, there's the three kind of um, areas that I'd like to kind of reflect on further in light of this paper. I think I'll leave it there. I think I've done the right time. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, uh, for this uh, really uh, uh, insightful uh, talk uh, with rich information and evidence. So now we have uh, about 15 minutes for questions. Um, now, um, so Derek, uh, could you turn on your camera? And then next uh, question from, from Michelle. And more questions, please follow. Yeah, type a question in the chat box. So Derek, please first, go first. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, well, thank you uh, Sarah. A, a excellent uh, presentation. And just uh, two questions. One factual, uh, are there any figures available on financial services exports from the UK for, for this year? Uh, how they compare to, uh, to previous years? And uh, 
And also the general question is, uh, what does this very limited impact of, of Brexit on financial services thus far tell us about the significance of the European passport, single European passport for financial services? Does it mean we, we have overestimated its significance? Uh, could this be one of the explanations? Thank you. I'm going to jump in and answer that now before a very large lorry, which is coming along my street, probably um, drowns me out. Um, I'm going to take the second part first. So I'm increasingly thinking that there might be value in placing the UK's membership within the EU in a longer history, because clearly the, you know, the history of the city is one when the UK has not been a member of the single market for most of that time, and yet London was a leading international financial centre. And um, I think this is really interesting and important because I think we need to reflect on the extent to which um, although London became Europe's financial centre in some senses, that was only one part of the international relations which London had with other financial centres, even during the UK single market membership. So um, is that the period of anomaly, the period of um, UK single market membership? And to what extent might we see a return to a more kind of global or international, genuinely global or international city and um, post-Brexit? And I think there's some really interesting analysis to be done by kind of putting the UK's membership of the single market in this much longer um, history, particularly actually when you think that the emphasis, we always ask research participants, where do they think new market opportunities lie? And they by and large always say sustainable finance and digital finance in terms of specific market areas. And then they always turn to some wider geographical markets, usually um, in Asia to varying degrees. That, that's a very, very common set of responses. Um, so, and I think that, that there is some policy evidence as to why that might be the case. The Johnson administration is very focused on this notion of global Britain. And in many ways, the city has been a kind of global financial center for far longer than the UK was a member of the, the EU. And also, as we've seen at the G7 and COP26 later this year, green, finance, the green and sustainability seem to be quite important. So you could see there being some momentum around green finance, I think, um, post-Brexit. Um, on the trade figures, um, there's a brilliant economist at the LSE, Thomas Sampson, who tracks um, trade statistics um, really um, fantastically. Um, and so I speak to him a little bit about the trade figures. The service impacts on trade, the data is lagging that on goods. But that that we do have for this year shows that services hasn't recovered as much as goods has recovered in. Sorry. So both goods and services are, are showing a persistent decline in exports to the EU. Um, goods appear to be recovering slightly more, which is, is interesting, I think. And there's some debate about the extent to which that's a reflection of a COVID shock um, earlier in well, late 2020, early 2021. Thank you. Uh, now, I think, Misha, uh, you, you have a question. Uh, could you turn on your camera and uh, microphone? I just, I, I just did. Well, well thank yes. you very much for your presentation, Sarah. It's always good to get updated on these things. A bit like Derek, I have a really a small empirical question and maybe followed up by a slightly larger philosophical one. The empirical one is, did any uh, any bank which used to be regulated as the bank by the Bank of England in terms of passporting, which now long, no longer is possible, uh, to which uh, regulatory bank did they switch? Because obviously most larger banks will have offices in any EU country and they can switch to their new preferred regulator. Could that, for instance, explain the move to Dublin? Because I suspect that the Irish regulator might be most similar in their dispositions towards the financial sector. Uh, as the EU is, whereas if they would transfer to the Bundesbank, they uh, would get a whole different central bank regime on their neck. But related to that, and that, that is the remark you just made, if you review, uh, and I beg your pardon, if you review Andy's early work on the EU financial space and Adam Tickell, both of them were really skeptical about the EU's ability to become a territorial thing, to make a regulatory area. 
if I read their word well, and maybe Andy will be able to correct me, it was always, no, it's going to be a global financial system. The EU is a lost cause to begin with. What are these people in Paris and Brussels even trying? If I exaggerate it maybe a bit, but it does read like that. So it's interesting right now that this idea of no, London is the global center, the EU territory is irrelevant, is resurfacing, because that would very much be to me the basic disposition of British financial geographers. And as somebody who's tried to disentangle what the EU as a financial space is about from a European perspective, it really struck me as a sort of a gap in the literature. It seems that from the perspective of London, it's really difficult to grasp the EU as a regulatory space because the default position seems to be it's obsolete by definition because finance is global and any, any effort to make a boundary across, even on a continental level, is therefore futile. So aren't we falling back into that trap thinking that finance is global because, and then there's little you can do about it. So on a slightly different level of abstraction, but I guess both might be interesting questions to hear your take on. Yeah, they're great questions. Um, so I wonder, my response to the second one is that I wonder if the nature of um, power relations in international finance has changed quite a bit since when Andrew and Adam writ wrote that book. Um, and, you know, clearly we've had periods where um, US hegemony has been kind of called into question. There's um, issues around the role of China within global finance. Are we moving to a more multipolar world in terms of international finance? And so um, I wouldn't want to suggest that if we situate London in a sort of uh, in its longer history and therefore suggest that perhaps in economic terms, the EU market has been less important than we might have thought. I wouldn't want to suggest that by extension, the EU doesn't matter. I think actually there's some really important areas where the EU does matter. Um, I think one of the most significant is around standard setting and green finance, where um, the EU has um, set up its kind of um, co codification system, for want of a better word, around green finance, and is really very keen to try and demonstrate global leadership in this. Um, you know, that there's an interesting question there about which part of the world is going to set the green standards internationally. And I think that's one area where the EU, I think, has some grounds for arguing it has a degree of first mover advantage. Um, so I, it, um, just because the kind of economics of where London trades might suggest that the EU is perhaps less important than uh, we might argue, might have thought previously, I think in other areas that the kind of international political economy of um, global finance would suggest that the EU is likely to remain quite important. Uh, Your first okay, question, you. can you just very quickly remind me that? <laughs> Well, did, did any bank change their passports after oh, the okay, yeah, was yeah. no longer their valid regulator? Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of debate, um, and and this comes through very strongly in our interviews around the approach of different regulators. Um, and I think you're exactly right, and it's a really like note to self, really not to sort of talk about EU regulation in a in a hegemonic or harmonious way necessarily. They have very different approaches financial services firms are very, very aware of it. And um, I think that in itself actually is a very interesting dynamic because when you speak to people at ESMA, for example, or the ECB, you know, projects around capital markets union are kind of one sort of um, set of tendencies. And at the other set, you have regulators like Dublin and to an extent um, Amsterdam, I would suggest, who are kind of deliberately trying to keep slightly arm's length from that. Um, more EU-wide approach. So I think that the, the um, dynamic between kind of um, fragmentation or kind of, kind of um, coalition building within the EU is, is really interesting on regulation in particular. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I thank you, Sarah, for, for that. Um, excellent account. Um, I know I've asked you this question before in a different forum. I'm gonna ask you again because I'm still kind of puzzled by it and sort of, um, I still understand it is, I suppose, so, you know, how did this happen, I guess, really? And what happened to this, the, the city treasury nexus? So I guess, you know, going back to what Mikhail was talking about earlier, that's the kind of thing that we were referring to, I guess, in terms of that power structure between financial interests and political interests through uh, 
long period of time with kind of influence regulation to try and benefit financial services in the UK. You know, and this seems, you know, in one sense, I suppose it's kind of going against it to some extent, or, or is it just a certain part of the city in terms of those parts of the city that are interested in kind of breaking down those barriers within Europe? But it was actually, you know, commiserations for kind of going through the 1994 paper and wading through that regulation theory and Gramsci and international political economy. But the, kind of an earlier paper I did with Nigel Thrift on, on the EU was really about kind of battering down those sorts of regulations so that UK financial services kind of move in there on a kind of you know, level playing field to some extent. Kind of representation of a different part of the city, of course, about that kind of much more global operation, that kind of more arbitrage. You know, you talked about Singapore on Thames, but just but you know this it the city is in the treasury the treasury rather has not gone away in terms of UK policy because you know you think about it in terms of austerity. And then more recently in some kind of COVID reaction, right? That, you know, the, the, the rapid opening up and, you know, the kind of moving back and forth that the treasury influence there seems to be very strong. So I'm kind of interested in that sort of what happened in between really in the, in the negotiations for, uh, for Brexit where they don't seem to be particularly influential or, what, or were they anyway? So that's, that, that's my question. Yeah, there's a brilliant paper by um, Scott James that's just come out. Um, he's a kind of um, political economy um, reader now, I believe, but it's really good. Um, also with um, Hussein Kasim, who um, discussed this very issue and the, the kind of challenges that the city had in holding a coalition together during the Brexit process in terms of the different interests of parts of the city itself but also um, how they try to leverage the sort of power of the city treasury nexus. And on occasion, they felt that they were following that. And then, so the example I gave in the paper when um, there was sort of support for um, mutual recognition, I think they felt like the, that the treasury was supporting them on that. The um, chancellor was supportive of that. The Bank of England was supportive of that. And then Theresa May, and gave the speech he gave, which essentially almost pulled the rug from that um, approach. So I th there's that element going on. And um, I think there's also um, another sort of story going on, which is how the city sits alongside the reworked Conservative Party. So I think the Conservative Party and Johnson's government is very different from previous Conservative parties in terms of its electoral coalition. Um, and, um, you know, for those of you outside the UK, he's very reliant on votes in former manufacturing regions, broadly put. So not, you know, um, we've asked some policymakers, you know, is the Conservative government still the, the party of business, for example? Um, you know, you would expect a Conservative government to be very supportive of the city. Um, at one level, I can see evidence that perhaps, you know, anything that looks to be supporting the city doesn't sit very well with their electoral coalition and certainly poses questions to a leveling up um, agenda. And some interviewees have explained to us that the area where they feel the UK could and possibly should diverge from EU regulation is in relation to the bankers bonus cap, the bankers remuneration policy, but they know they can't go there because of the politics around that, which is quite um, interesting. On the other hand, Rishi Sunak is himself used to work at Goldman Sachs. Um, so I find it quite hard to believe that the government and the Treasury in particular doesn't understand the importance of financial services. And I think that is why towards the end of the paper, I kind of draw attention to the amount of regulatory reviews which are going on for financial services, a lot of it actually under the radar. Um, and that to me suggests that this question of the sort of um, electoral coalition that's supporting the government might actually be quite important. And there's a lot going on that I think is more deregulatory than initially appears, but it isn't being um, reported um, aggressively. So I think the, the best example of this was when um, Rishi Sunak gave his budget in March 2021, and he actually used the phrase economic geography and said, you know, that Britain needs to engage with its new economic geography. And he meant levelling up. But actually, obviously, there's another new economic geography for the UK, which is outside of the EU, which he didn't mention. But on the same day, um, the Hill Listings Review came out, um, kind of looking at that other economic geography. So I think that there's these two kind of economic geographies. They're rarely brought into kind of public dialogue. But 
I find it quite hard to believe that there isn't work going on on this this European one. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. I think uh, uh, it's already nine, but um, please feel free to leave uh, if you have other appointments. But uh, uh, we can keep uh, the conversation uh, finishing all these questions, but short short answers or short questions. Okay. Uh, so David, uh, are you still there? David, yes. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, but not very clearly. Hello? Hi, David. Hello. We cannot hear you, David. Okay, sorry, can you okay. hear me now? I'm very yes, sorry yes, to take your time. Yeah. Okay. No, I think I have very similar questions as, as what came before. I think I was also a bit puzzled about, yeah, how did this happen uh, to, the, to the financial sector? Uh, because it kind of contradicts what we, what we learn in terms of how they control the battle of representation, to use the words of Doreen Messi. So kind of, yeah, um, how does this logic of what is good for the city, is good for the UK, is good for Europe, how this was kind of turned around uh, through these events. But I think Sarah, you already gave quite a bit of answers to my question, um, uh, through the answers on, on the question of Michiel and, and Andy. So uh, if you want to add, uh, go ahead, but I think you already covered that. <laughs> yeah, right. and... Uh, do you want me to respond, Feng Huang? Uh, please, uh, short, uh, short. Yeah, no, question, just very yeah. quickly. Uh, one thing that has really come across in our empirical research is the length of time it took the city, apart from maybe the insurance sector, to adapt to the result. So when we ask people to reflect on the outcome of the result, it's quite striking the, the the answers that we get in terms of the shock and how like people couldn't kind of compute what had happened and they had these kind of abstract contingency plans but they didn't really think they were going to need to use that comes across very strongly in ways that I probably haven't quite done justice to in this talk. Okay, uh, David, uh, this uh, okay, not uh, Martin. Sorry, Martin, are you there? Please. Big question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for the excellent um, paper and excellent research. Uh, I, I was just struck by the fact, if I read the one of your slides correctly, Dublin is uh, one of the biggest recipients of those jobs lost after Brexit in financial services, which is which surprised me because Dublin is a small place. Um, so my question is like why why this is happening and whether the, the bilateral uh, agreements uh, between the UK and Ireland that actually precede the EU membership played any role in this. In fact, like I see that there is actually kind of special regime between the UK and Ireland in terms of almost free movement uh, of people, et cetera, et cetera, various kind of uh, different things. So I wonder to what extent that may have played a role or is there any other explanation for this? Yeah, thanks, Martin. And there's there's two main things going on there, I think. One is the approach of the Dublin regulator. And um, it, in, in our research, the, um, the approach to regulation taken by Dublin is seen as being um, rather like um, Michelle said, kind of similar to in a sort of philosophical stance, that of the UK, but also seen as... Um, curiously being quite kind of apolitical so and um, this is where I think the case of Paris is really interesting because I think Macron has been the most vocal in terms of leaders in terms of attracting finance but I think that could actually end up having some kind of um, counter um, outcomes to what he's actually wanting because there seems to be a sense that um, as soon as kind of regulation becomes politicized in, in that sort of way the sector itself starts to become um, more concerned so I think regulation is one and I think you're exactly right that um, the common travel area between um, the UK and um, Ireland is really important I actually don't think we've seen the importance of that fully played out yet so um, and I haven't spoken about it in this paper, but I think the impacts of the, the, 
the Brexit trade deal on the mobility of professionals um, has, has almost been in cold storage because of COVID and the fact that people haven't been traveling. But um, the holding an Irish passport has been said to me to be like one of the most valuable things that you could have in terms of mobility. And I, disclaimer, I don't have an Irish passport. Um, but in terms of facilitating movement in the EU and between the, the UK and, and Ireland, and I, I think that actually is non-trivial in terms of what we know about how services are delivered. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Because of the time is uh, we have running out of time. So the, the last question, Patrick, is a quick question. Uh, so I think you can you can answer the question. Uh, uh, sure, Patrick, sure, sure. Yes. That was a great presentation. Thank you for that. You cited a couple of figures in your piece on banking assets leaving the UK. And I was just wondering if you could tell me what the source was and also mention what you know about them. Were they cross-border deposits, local deposits, cross-border lending, derivatives? What, what kind of assets are we talking about? Thank you. Yeah, um, Patrick, I saw that in the chat and I was going to say that I'll drop you an email with the source and then I can send you um, all the details. That's probably the best Excellent. way to do it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for everyone for uh, attending this okay. event. Um, so, okay, uh, we'll see you next uh, uh, for two weeks, okay, uh, for, for, from He Shenjing, uh, Professor Shenjing He from Hong Kong University. Um, so uh, now uh, we will close the, the seminar and feel free to join us in the, uh, if you click the link in the chat box, okay. Uh, thank you again for attending today's seminar. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very Take much. Care. Thanks, sir. Thank Bye. You.